Welcome, everybody. This is the mentoring session with Greg, Greg Braden for a five-year guide to our future. And Greg is right here with me, and I'm just going to hand it over to him. I want to let you know that this is a webinar format, so we're going to have you put your questions in the chat, if you would, and that will help us organize what's going on. And we can then bring, I'll probably look at the questions as will other people online that are helping here. And we will um, pass them off to Greg and he can answer them. Uh, Greg, would you like to introduce uh, today's discussion? Hey, Adam. Well, first of all, uh, Adam, I wanna thank you for hosting. It's the first time you and I have worked together in this, this format. And uh, I'm excited to do that. I wanna just say thank you to everyone who is, is taking the course and is still with it. Uh, I hope you're having as much fun taking the course as I had putting it together for you. Uh, you know, it couldn't have been more timely. We had no idea. You know, this the the idea for the course was actually put together in uh, I have a three to five year rolling plan or three to five year. Uh, yeah, it's, it's a rolling business plan where I have to know three to five years in advance what I'm going to be talking about so I can develop the content and. Um, you know, and know where it's going to fit. And I had no way of knowing three to five years ago that the the modules in this course would be as current as they are. Some of them, uh, you know, perhaps more so than others, but um, it, it couldn't have been better timing. So I want to thank everyone for for your trust once again and for your willingness to explore these topics. And I'm, I'm going to say right off the bat, I uh, I know that some of the things that I'm sharing with you are um, are very different from the narratives you're hearing in the mainstream because I'm getting those same narratives. So, uh, so that's what makes it exciting. It'll make for a lively, hopefully a lively Q&A today. I have been out of the country. I was on an extended uh, Holy Land tour in the, um, in the Middle East. Uh, I am still a little jet lagged today. <laughs> so I'm happy to be with you. And uh, uh, just wanted you to know that uh, that's why you haven't heard from me for about three weeks. We, we were with, uh, leading a group through the Palestinian as well as the Israeli areas. Mm -hmm. And um, it was just a beautiful opportunity. And I, what I wanna say ab about that is, uh, you know, you, it's only when you're on the ground with the people that you can really see what's going on. And it's so much different than what you're seeing on CNN or MSNBC or Fox News or any legacy media. And it restored my hope even to a deeper degree in my faith. And, and the people themselves, because the people know how to live together and they know how to love and care for one another. Uh, it's a handful of, uh, of people in positions of power that seem to be you know, having more of the problems. So uh, some of you may have been with me on that trip. I know there are people on that trip that were taking this course as well. And I wanna thank you for, for sharing that journey. So, um, well, let me ask this, we get two ways to do this. Adam, do we have any, any questions right up front? And if we don't, then I can, I can launch into some thoughts. And if we do, I want to get to as many as we can as quickly as we can. Well, I think we did have, a, we do have a question. Well, I wanted to mention that we have people calling on this call from Colombia, Australia, Finland, uh, Canada, of course, US, Austria, Latvia. Uh, it's quite amazing that people stay up at all hours to, to engage. <clears throat> but we do have a question, uh, which I think was what we were talking about earlier. How does yeah. the Bitcoin stop the consolidation of wealth? So that kind of, I think we'll get a number of questions about um, a blockchain in Bitcoin. You might you might want to take that on. So uh, could you repeat that question? How does the, the Bitcoin... How does Bitcoin stop the consolidation of wealth? I'm not sure I understand what that question means. The consolidation of wealth for individuals or for corporations or nations. Do you have any, any sense? Are there, are there any words around that, Adam? No, but I think there are other questions around uh, blockchain and Bitcoin uh, and just sort of what's going on with that. And I think yeah. you, you mentioned this earlier, too, kind of. The yeah, you, you know, and I have to tell you, uh, being out of the United States and, um, I, you know, I don't watch TV um, unless, you know, I'm in a hotel some someplace and maybe I'll be watching for political you know, events or see if it's a good day to to have a, a, the conference in whatever country I'm in. But I have to tell you, as I was going through the airports, uh, certainly on the planes and in the country, countries uh, that I have visited in the last uh, 60 days, 
Uh, blockchain technology is on everybody's mind. There are multiple competing narratives that are out there based upon multiple competing agendas. And I, I addressed, in, in general, I addressed the, the principle of this in, in the two modules in the course. One was on blockchain, specifically what it is, why, why it offers us something that we've never had before, the transparency, certainly the security, uh, and the immutable records, that, that immutable, they cannot be altered once they are, are in place. We've never had that before when it comes to any transactions, including our, our financial transactions. It's even more apparent than ever now that the legacy financial systems feel threatened by this technology, and they're capitalizing on the a few bad actors and the collapse of some of the exchanges to specifically to give in general a bad name and to try to frighten people out of any kind of, uh, uh, of the, the cryptocurrency markets. Uh, and the backdrop of that is at the same time that that's happening, the United States uh, piloted three cities uh, for, uh, I think it was a, a one week period, the first US digital dollar was piloted uh, and they're doing a number of tests to see how this is going to work. And I think they are, they are seeing the crypto markets as a, a threat to the, uh, the superiority, the perceived superiority of the US dollar. And <clears throat> you know, it doesn't have to be either or, but this is the way that, that they're seeing it. So what's happening right now is that Bitcoin specifically is being lumped in with all cryptocurrencies in general. All cryptocurrencies in general are being lumped in with the collapse of some of the big exchanges that were uh, due to, to greed, human greed, and just an arrogance that is just uh, un unbelievable in terms of, of what was happening. So they're trying to lump all this in together and say it's all bad. It's all done, it's all over and frighten people away on the one hand. On the other hand, we've all, we've all heard the, uh, the, the phrase, follow the money. If you look at what's happening behind the scenes, the people that are dissing crypto in the mainstream media uh, and the corporations and the banks, they're buying this stuff up like crazy, buying Bitcoin. So <clears throat> they know that Bitcoin has a place in the, uh, in the financial future uh, of America and of the world, and uh, they are hoping to, to get a better price, I think is what they're doing. They're driving that, that price down. So blockchain technology is not going away. Uh, it is the basis, it's, it's the, the technological solution for money, as we talked about in the course, it's not gonna go away. Uh, it is still new. And the events that we're seeing now are flushing out the, the bad actors. And I'll tell you, it's, it's frightening and it's very sad to see uh, how severe the, what's called the collateral damage or the, um, uh, from FTX specifically. But what I wanna say about this, I think we all remember the, uh, the, the collapse in 2008, 2007, 2008, 2009, when Lehman Brothers collapsed and that was a bad actor in Lehman Brothers was a bad actor in the financial system that, that we have. Uh, and that is equivalent to, you can, you can draw a strong parallel between what happened with Lehman Brothers and what happened with FTX. Both of them were using leverage trading. Both of them were, uh, were trading the funds that they didn't have. They were using um, their customers' funds. But when Lehman Brothers collapsed, we didn't do away with the dollar. So when FTX is collapsing or it has collapsed now, uh, I, I don't think it's a reason to do away with Bitcoin. Bitcoin is separate from all of those other digital currencies that copied and tried to mimic the, the fundamental principles of, of Bitcoin. I had, uh, I had a gentleman on the, uh, that I spoke with recently while I was on the trip saying that there were so many other blockchains that are so much better than Bitcoin right now. Uh, you know, why would anybody be interested in Bitcoin? Bitcoin was, it was designed to do very, very few things very, very well. And it continues to do that. It is the most secure blockchain. 
Uh, it is uh, designed to, to have scarcity built into it. And scarcity is one of the fundamental principles of, of money that we talked about in, in the, the module in the, uh, in the course. Uh, there are, I think, approximately 20,000 other digital crypto coins that are out there right now. The estimates are that probably 99% of those are going to fail <clears throat> because they are not built with the principles, the integrity of Bitcoin. So uh, it's, it's kind of like, um, I mean, it's a new technology and we're witnessing, we're on the ground level of a new technology flushing out the bad actors and the things that don't work. And I'm actually, uh, I'm impressed that Bitcoin's holding up as well as it is, as it goes through the, you know, the whole process. Nations now are adopting it. New financial institutions are now adopting it. <clears throat> and um, the regulation, I'm just reiterating what was in, in that module, is that Bitcoin specifically is not a security. It's not a stock. You don't buy it like you buy a stock and it's not taxed like a stock. It is a commodity just the way precious metals are a commodity. Uh, and so you can think of it from, from that perspective, although it is new. So uh, when you talk about consolidation of wealth, I'm not sure what exactly, if someone wants to kind of clarify in the chat what that might be, Adam, I'm, I'm happy to address that specifically. Thanks, Greg. I did get a follow-up question that says, uh, I find it difficult to relate to money and the exchange of money as a spiritual aspect of life. Any sure. insights on that? Yeah, and uh, you know, it's uh, it's a very different way of looking at it because we uh, live in a society where money has been demonized, and we have been conditioned to think of money as uh, as something that's bad. Money is the root of all evil. You know, is what we've been what we've been told. Uh, and I, I did address this. Maybe I didn't address it uh, clearly enough in in the module that I think we're all, we all can agree that we are spiritual beings and that we exert spiritual energy in our endeavors in life. Uh, when we are part of a society, it is our spiritual energy that is contributing to society in one of a number of ways. We are either producing services that other people need, goods that other people need, you know, maybe working in a, a factory or maybe an artist or something like that, services, uh, you know, all kinds of, it can be counseling services, can be body work, massage therapy, I mean, you know, medical, any, anything we're doing for someone else, information services, uh, you know, uh, where we are, are sharing information about ourselves and our lives. All of those are the product of our spiritual energy. This is our, our energy, our life force that we are putting into creating these things. And maybe for some people, there is a, a, a thinking that spirituality somehow has something to do with religion and something to do with uh, other than, than everyday life. So let's maybe take a half step back. At its, at its foundation, uh, the very root of spirituality is about relationships. It's about our relationship to ourselves. That's a deeply spiritual principle. Our relationship to God or a higher power, that's a deeply spiritual principle. Our relationship to the cosmos, our relationship to the field that underlies all existence, our relationship to other people, our relationship to the earth, our relationship to the past, our relationship to the future. These are all the fundamental principles of spirituality and how we relate in all of those, uh, all of those, those different ways. So when we talk about our spiritual energy being expended, we are compensated for our spiritual energy in, uh, in another form of energy that the idea is that that energy possesses integrity and can be uh, preserved and exchanged at a later period in time where we're, we're compensated for the spiritual energy that we've expended to provide the good services and information. So this is this is the fundamental principle of money. This is um, uh, you know something economists struggle with all the time because money has meant different things to different societies over time, but it, it's all always been about compensating us for 
uh, our expenditure of, of energy, and maybe the word spiritual is what's new here, <clears throat> but it is, uh, is our, our life force, our life energy. At present in the United States and in the West, we're being compensated with a currency that is corrupt. So it's not based on anything. The US dollar, the Euro, the British pound, uh, Swiss franc, they are not based on anything right now. They're called fiat currencies. <clears throat> they are corrupt because they're being manipulated. The, the value is manipulated to serve those that benefit from, from having that value changed. Interest rates are a part of that. Um, inflation is a part of that. So what's so different about Bitcoin specifically is that, that these things cannot happen with Bitcoin. It cannot be manipulated uh, because it is governed by, uh, by an algorithm. So it doesn't require human intervention. And the human intervention is, is where the problems are, are coming from. The corruptible, uh, you know, human uh, agencies and, you know, human thinking and human greed and, you know, all the things that we all certainly are familiar with. So uh, I, I, the first to admit, I, I struggled with this myself when I really began to delve into this in 2010, 2011, to see what, what a digital currency really meant, what was its potential. And when I began to understand how for the first time it holds the potential in 5,000 years of, of human civilization to honor an individual for the, the spiritual energy that they have put into whatever it is that they're doing and to be rewarded for that energy in a way that cannot be manipulated, cannot be controlled, cannot be weaponized, the way that our fiat currency is right now. Uh, it, was, it is a mind blower because it's, it's a completely different paradigm. Also, I'm going to say that what I'm sharing is not a view that you're, it's, it's not a commonly held view in mainstream. So you're not going to hear this kind of a conversation on MSNBC or, you know, the, the Yahoo Finance or, or anything like that. Fox News, CNN, they're not going to talk about it from, from this perspective. <clears throat> I was listening to a debate on one of the, uh, among four people that are considered crypto experts uh, in uh, this morning, I was listening to this. Uh, it was a digital, it was on, an online debate. Two of them are very closely linked to uh, legacy financial institutions. And they're convinced that there's no need, there's no reason, uh, and that uh, any, any kind of crypto, including Bitcoin, is, is dead. Uh, and the others are recognizing that we're in the infancy of, of a new technology. And there's a lot of pushback against this technology because it threatens the mainstream, the legacy systems, the central banking systems that have the power and the control over our lives and over our money right now. Uh, you know, something a lot of people may not know in the, what's called the fractional, fractional banking system. Pre-COVID, the, the law was that when you make a deposit in the bank, that 10% of what you deposit has to remain uh, with the bank. The other 90% can be loaned out, it can be invested, you know, whatever it is the bank wants to do with, with our money. That was waived during COVID. And now 0% has to be kept uh, on the bank, uh, in the bank. When you, if you put in $100, they can take that $100 and they can do, they can invest it. Uh, a lot of it now is, is being used to fund war. And a lot of people have a hard time with that, including myself. I, why should my spiritual energy be used to fund weapons of war and destruction against my brothers and sisters anywhere on this planet? So it's, it's a personal thing for me. It's just uh, my feeling about war itself. <clears throat> but the point is that we have no control over that with the, the banking system that we have right now. And crypto changes all of that. And if people, enough people begin using this alternative, this parallel system, <clears throat> it makes it very difficult to fund war. It makes it very difficult to do a lot of the things that, uh, that are happening right now that cause suffering in people's lives. So I'm not surprised there's a lot of pushback, and we're going to see this pushback 
in a lot of different areas. And this happens to be one that's just up uh, in, in our current view right now, because every day, every day on every news broadcast, we're hearing about uh, the FTX collapse, uh, the ripple effect uh, specifically, and then in general, how bad crypto is for, for, for the banking markets. So I don't know if that helps at all, uh, Adam, but see if we get any questions around that. Right. We probably don't want the whole hour to be about Bitcoin. Maybe there's a lot of other subjects coming up, but there is one other sure. uh, thread on the Bitcoin that keeps coming up. And that is this hot wallet, cold wallet, putting your Bitcoin in an exchange, sure. recommending exchanges, like finding a, a trusted source for the right thing to do if you were going to go into the route of Bitcoin. Yeah. Well, I, in uh, again, I, I address those things a little bit in the in the course, I gave you some references. Um, you know, I uh, the whole idea. Okay, so I'm, I'm going to make this distinction once again. Bitcoin has never been corrupted. The Bitcoin blockchain has never been hacked. It is the most secure blockchain, uh, the most secure technology that we have we've ever known. And I, I even gave some stats of uh, in, in the module of of how many attempts it would take to break the, uh, the Bitcoin blockchain as a function of, of the number of atoms in the universe. That's how many uh, iterations would have to take place to, to break that, that blockchain technology. People push back and they say, what about quantum computers? That is being taken into account now. Quantum computer hack proof is what's happening with the, the Bitcoin blockchain. So uh, I'm just, I'm, again, I'm going to make a distinction between that and all of the other stuff that has grown up around it. There's a whole industry, you know, that has grown up around it. So the, the Bitcoin itself is intact. The, uh, the fundamentals have never changed. And I think it is as valid now as it was when Satoshi Nakamoto put out that white paper in 2009, uh, mysteriously, you know, whoever he or they uh, are or, or were. Now, to access the Bitcoin, we need what's called an on-ramp or an off-ramp, off and that's where the exchanges come in. So it's kind of like you've got dollars, but to access dollars, you know, you need a bank. <clears throat> and the, the, uh, the exchanges that exist right now, because it's a new technology, they're not being regulated, and there's a lot of push now to to have some kind of regulation for the exchanges, which I think is, is a good thing for the exchanges themselves. So the exchanges are where the collapse is happening. Um, FTX is, was just the most recent. 2022 was a, was a tough year for, uh, you know, for crypto because a number of these exchanges collapsed for a number of different reasons. Some of it was naive. Some of it was greed, uh, black swan events, you know, you name it. So the exchanges are where you access, where you buy and sell your Bitcoin. And, uh, and if you simply use them for that, if you purchase Bitcoin, and then once you have it, you pull it off of the exchange using what's called a cold wallet. And I gave some examples of cold wallets uh, in, in the module. Uh, then you cannot be hurt when one of these exchanges collapse. They can do whatever they want to do. And you've, you know, you're holding it. You've got your own it's on your, your cold wallet, it's in your safe deposit box or wherever it is that you, you wanna keep it. And you can keep uh, multiple, multiples as well. Uh, I'm not a financial advisor and I can't really give advice for where to put your money or what to do. What I will say is in, in the United States, not, not all exchanges are available in all nations. There are regulations, certain nations will not allow these exchanges and certain ones do. <clears throat> so the FTX that collapsed was, was a FTX International. Uh, it had a, an FTX US counterpart that now has been, uh, has been closed down as well, but, it, but they appear to be solvent. Uh, in the United States, probably statistically the most trusted and the, the largest um, of those exchanges called Coinbase. Uh, Coinbase has been around for a long time, very easy to use, very solvent. They, um, you know, they're, they're not mismanaging their funds. 
just one fine point where a, a lot of the problems come in, these exchanges, some of them allow for more than just buying and selling a Bitcoin. They allow for trading, uh, which is risky, and they allow for what's called leveraged trading, which is kind of like if you're familiar with options in the traditional markets, it's kind of like options where you can you can leverage, you know, uh, 10, per, 10, 20, 30 times, you know, what you're where you think the price is going to go. And if you uh, if you're wrong, you're going to lose a lot of money. And that's what brought these exchanges down initially. That's people were were losing more than than they had. So I'm, I'm saying it's because Coinbase doesn't it's not doesn't allow that it's not about uh it's not about uh, leverage trading it's more about buying and selling so if if i were going to personally if i were going to to purchase anything i would trust personally i trust coinbase <clears throat> for the purchase and the sell but still you might want to take it off once you buy it and put it into a cold wallet um, ledger is one that's very popular now there's one that's being advertised a lot it's called arculus it's like a credit card like a, a tap credit card uh, where you can just carry it in your billfold and you've got your your bitcoin uh you know in in your billfold and you can use it convert it back you know wherever you want on uh, on uh, another exchange if you wanted to do that so uh so i agree adam i mean it's it, we don't want the whole the whole time to be about this it's up for everybody because it's on everybody's mind it was a, a module in the course and it's in the news so I'm just going to invite people to, when you're watching the news, if you can do a couple of things, Bitcoin is not FTX. Bitcoin is not all the other cryptocurrencies that are out there. Bitcoin is the first. It's the most stable. It's the most secure. Uh, it's the most threatening in terms of what's happening right now. Uh, and I think once these exchanges are flushed out, the, the bad actors in the exchanges, and we get some regulation for the exchanges, you're going to see mass adoption. You're already seeing it in countries, but now you're going to see mass adoption with uh, on financial markets once there's some regulation in place. And um, and I think that's the momentum that we're just a little ahead of the, the curve right now. That's the momentum that will make this more prevalent uh, on a global a global scale. Thank you for that. Good. There are quite a few questions in here about um, God eternal within the body, yeah. uh, sort of uh, potential uh, DNA manipulation in the past, sure. and also whether you know whether it's just for humans or whether because there are other animals involved. There's a lot of questions about the kind of the intelligence. Yeah, thing. yeah. Well, so let me first of all, I uh, as you know, I was in. Um, I was uh, co-leading a group with uh, Bruce Lipton, my dear brother, Bruce Lipton, who, who's in the course. We led uh, a group through 150-ish people through the Holy Land tour, uh, Israeli and Palestinian areas. Um, part of that tour was at the Israeli museum, and there's a special part of the museum called the Shrine of the Book. And the Shrine of the Book is uh, a special exhibit that was built to house the first seven of the Dead Sea Scrolls um, that were found in, in 11 caves in the mid 20th century. So there are many other scrolls, but the first seven are, are housed there. And there is a theater and they gave me permission to uh, offer a, a presentation on the Dead Sea Scrolls in the theater. And then we got up and walked into the exhibit itself. So people were, were right there to see it. And uh, as part of that, I was able to to share the 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 name that is encoded within the DNA of uh, of of our bodies, and uh, I just have to tell you when the people whose native language is what those scrolls are written on, and when they could see that in in that language, the name and the DNA of of all life, all carbon based life. Uh, is the same name that's on those texts that were 2,500, 3,000 years old. Uh, it made it made God eternal within the body very real for them and and for for our group as well. So uh, again, this is a very different way of of thinking. It's not something, you know, if you Google it, you're not going to see a, a lot of support for what I'm sharing with you because it, it's original research. 
and it is uh, it is a, a very very different way of, of thinking. So uh, I'm just going to tell a little story. When I was um, right after the book came out, the God Code came out in 04, and I was on a, a book tour at the time, and uh, I was giving a presentation inside the Beltway in Washington D.C. Uh, you never know who's going to come to a Washington, D.C. event. Really interesting people. I mean, political people, congressmen, congresswomen, people from National Bureau of Standards, people from um, the, uh, the patent office. I had people there from the U.S. patent office that were talking to me about some of these things. And um, so I made a comment as I was sharing the, the message encoded into the DNA of all human cells. My comment was, I would love to have the DNA from life that's not from Earth to see if the, the code is the same as the life from, from Earth. Now, I'm, I'm not saying I wanted like sticky, gooey DNA in my hand, but what I, I would love to have a computer printout of, of a, a genome sequence from life that you know, is not on Earth. I made that statement, we took a break. And uh, a man walked up to me from the uh, from the back of the room and he handed me a business card that had three phone numbers on it and he said when you're ready for uh that dna not from earth he said call call these numbers so it told me that they have that dna uh i never called the numbers uh because i didn't want to be on the list that i would be on if i had called those numbers there was a uh, a white house number a pentagon number and a private private number and uh, uh, I may at some time, I may. But what it told me is that we, someone has a genome sequence from non-terrestrial life. And so it opened the door to the question, does this code exist in, in other places? To the best of my knowledge, and, and I believe I, I stated this in, in the module, all carbon-based life would have this code. Um, that means all plants, all animals have the code, but the code is the, the concentration of the God eternal within the body uh, is different in different forms of life. So the name that is in the DNA, it's actually one of the names of God, YH, Yah, is one of the, that's the personal name that if you, if you accept the biblical text as historical, uh, an historical document, Yah was the name that was revealed uh, to Moses on Sinai when, the, uh, when Moses received the, the texts uh, and the, the commandments. So the name that is encoded into the carbon-based DNA is actually the personal name of God. And when you look at uh, what we're, again, this is all based hydrogen, nitrogen, oxygen, carbon. And then there are some other elements in there, some sulfur and some phosphorus and things like that. It, it, we are made of different combinations of God eternal within the body. For us, God's personal name shows up a lot in our DNA, less so in a blade of grass. So is it still God's name? Yes, but the concentrations are different. For, for different forms of life. And, you know, if, if, uh, if we find that the DNA from life that is, is not from Earth uh, has exactly the same concentrations that we have, then it suggests that we have a common, a common ancestor, that we come from a common source, which, of course, is what the ancient texts tell us. Uh, it's what every indigenous tradition that I've ever studied tells us. It's what the Sumerian texts have always said, the ancient, uh, the cuneiform texts, so it would, it would confirm digitally what we have seen culturally uh, for, for a very long time. And for some people, it doesn't make any difference. And for other people, it, it really, it, it makes it very real. And I have to tell you, Adam, uh, for me, you know, when I was understanding this code, it took me a long time to figure this out to find a mathematic link between the periodic table of elements and the, uh, the mysterious numbers that underlie the ancient alphabets. It took me a long time to figure it out. And it was in the wee hours of the morning, uh, probably 2.30, 3 o'clock a.m., uh, when I was doing this by hand. 
<clears throat> on uh, I had stacks of of legal tablets where I was running through this to get the algorithm worked out by hand, and then of course it could be computer coded. And the, the first time I saw that message uh, appear, I thought maybe it was a mistake, and so I went back and I I did it all again. And when I knew that it wasn't a mistake, I have to say honestly something changed within me. Uh, I felt differently about myself, about my relationship to the world, about my relationship to God. Uh, and I knew beyond a shadow of a doubt that I was not the product. I am not the product of a random mutation, uh, as Darwin's theory would, would suggest, that there's intentionality underlying my existence, that my life is a gift. And, and what that meant to me, Adam, was Knowing that, the question is, what, how can I honor my gift? What, what will I do with the gift that, that I've been given, the gift of my life, the gift of my body? And I'm still exploring the answer to that question. But it becomes a touchstone, knowing. And we did this for the group. I, I gave that presentation day one on the Holy Land tour, God Eternal Within the Body. And it was a theme that came up again and again and again throughout that not from a religious perspective, but from a perspective that there's something very precious and very unique about human life that's worth preserving in a world where technology uh, is being encouraged to replace the, the biological life that holds that message. So there's a whole conversation we can have about that, but uh, you asked me to speak to it. I'm not sure if, if that covered if that covered the... Uh, the question or not, or if there are more specifics uh, about that, Adam, what do you think? I think it covered most of it. I, I, it of course, it, it excites me a lot. I love this connection because it just reminds me of the deep connection with all life, all being that we have, that we are, uh, and that. Um, but yes, the, there were questions about other elements that might be coming to play, or the the amino acids, and whether there's something there. Uh, but they're a little vague, so I, I don't know whether to bring those out. Well, you can't. I mean, it, it, it's all it's all part of it. The amino acids of the human body. The when we look at the, you look at the genome, uh, and the the genome for uh, for human, uh, we have there are are sixty four codes that create the, the genome for the, or the, the amino acid, the amino acid side chains. And th those are chemical equivalents of the letters of the ancient alphabets. So when you begin to understand that, what we're talking about is two different ways of, of talking about the same thing. Uh, when the ancient texts say with words, you know, that we were created from uh, you know, from the mysterious letters of, of the alphabets, that, that makes no sense to a scientist until you convert those letters into elements. Now you say we are made from the elements of of the earth, and you know now you're talking apples, apples, and apples. So what we're looking at are two different descriptions of life separated by about three thousand years of of human time. Uh, and the, the language that describes these relationships is subject to interpretation and change and through translations, things are lost. And that's the beauty of the mathematic link. The mathematics uh, don't change over time. The same numbers that are equivalents to the letters of these ancient alphabets uh, 3,000 years ago are the numbers, that, those are the numbers that are still present today. One of the, the big mysteries from linguists, where did those numbers even come from? You know, did somebody just make them up? They just pull them out of the air? And now we know that's not true. The mysterious numbers of the ancient alphabets are directly linked to the elements of the stuff our world is made of and us through, uh, through the periodic table. And that's what took me so long to figure out. It's, it's the, the number that we call atomic mass. So, so the bottom line for me is if we, in, in, the second, in, the, in the second century, there were 32 rabbinical rules that were revealed to address these numbers. 
And this is a, this made it a science. These rules have to be followed if the consideration of the numbers is to be valid. So what I did was I crossed the traditional boundaries between ancient wisdom and modern science. I treated the periodic table the way that I would treat the ancient alphabets with those rabbinical numbers. And I treated the ancient alphabets the way I would treat the periodic table with atomic mass and atomic weight and things like that. And the equivalence is, is the number. The number is, is what doesn't change. So when we allow ourselves to embrace the great ways of knowing without judging one as being right or wrong or good or bad or more sophisticated, just well, we can just think that they are different ways of knowing. And I, I think we owe it to ourselves, Adam, to, to embrace the wisdom of those who have come before us. They were trying to tell us something. They were trying to tell us something, and the only way they knew how in the language of their time. Is it old? Yes. Is it obsolete? It's No, it's still part of the story. So I think we owe it to ourselves to understand what did our ancestors, what were they trying to say to us then? And what does it mean in, in our lives, in our world today? And, and for people that believe in reincarnation, who were those ancestors? It may have been you who had taken this course. You may have left something to us in your lifetime thousands of years ago that you knew you would recognize in this lifetime now as the trigger for the awakening, as a trigger for the, the memory that would bring to light the deep truth of your existence as, as a touchstone in a world where everything is being questioned and there are agendas trying to overturn the most cherished values of human life. So I think all these things are possible right now. We're, we're living this convergence of cycles. It's a little window in time when the world is changing and it's going to change. The question is, are we going to come in for a soft landing or a hard landing? And I think that by embracing the deep truths of our existence, we help to navigate ourselves into a softer landing with less suffering because we're making choices based on what's true not information that has been manipulated because of, of greed uh, or because of, of hate. And I, I think those are important distinctions to make. Yes, thank you for that. I, I, I think it, many people have expressed in the watch parties to the, the, the kind of um, liberation they feel when you connect the past, the kind of spiritual traditions of, of the distant ancient past with science, because that's, that's one of these dis dissonance that we've been living in this that science sort of killed the past it was like no that was all superstition only science going forward yeah well you know one of the things that i i believe i uh i mentioned this i don't know if i mentioned it in the course i mentioned it i think in one of the fireside chats when i was a kid i always believed and as an adult i still wanted to believe that somehow science was immune to uh, to the hate and to the greed and to the corruption that happened in so many other facets of life. And unfortunately, and this really came to light during the climate crisis that we're being told we have right now and during COVID, that science has been corrupted as well. Science has been hijacked by, <clears throat> by political interest. Uh, it's been hijacked by the church. It's been hijacked by, certainly by politics. Uh, it has been hijacked by industry, hijacked by technology. And so along with trying to set the ship, the, the course of our ship right with everything else, we're also trying to do the same thing with science as well. And a lot of people lost trust in science because it has been hijacked. Data has been cherry picked um, and scientists have been corrupted. They've been bought off. They've been paid off. Uh, by the industries that fund their research, which uh, is very sad. Uh, I didn't want to acknowledge that. I had to because the, the, that's what the data shows. The, the evidence supports that. So when we talk about science now, even science is taking on a new role um, in, in our lives. Today. For me, the bottom line, Adam, we ask science to tell us who we are. And science is doing a really jo good job of, of doing that. Science 
pure science is giving us the answers. The question is, are we willing to accept the answers that science is offering? And, uh, and that is being answered differently by different scientists. The climate debate is a, is a huge part of this. When you look at the scientists that are <clears throat> supporting the mainstream narrative and look at where their funding comes from, there is, there's a conflict of interest that, uh, that never used to exist in these kinds of these kinds of debates, but that conflict of interest is there now. Very few scientists are out there who are not beholden either through university research or through private industry or lobbyists that are not being paid to say what it is that they're saying about the climate. And we are the ones that are suffering because our lives, our lifestyles, uh, our, our children's futures are all being compromised based on that corruption. And this is a time when it's all coming to light. It, all, it has to, it has to. So, uh, so the science plays a powerful role and we have to, science is meant to be constantly updated. It is not a static body of information. Science is a living body of information and it's meant to be constantly updated as new information comes to light. When politicians and former presidents have come out and said, that the debate is over, uh, all the information is in, there is no more debate. That was a heads up that this was going to be a political fight and, and not a science fight because true science is always being updated as new information comes to light. That's how you keep science honest. If we want science honest, we have to honor the new evidence that comes to light. Whether it's evolution, whether it's our origins, whether it's climate, whether it's uh, you know, where viruses originate, you know, whatever, whatever it is. And that's hard for some people because we live in a world where we've been taught that the world is static. We've been taught that climate should always be the way it's always been in our lifetimes. And if it changes, that something is broken. And we've been taught that, uh, you know, financial systems should always be the way that they've always been. Uh, these are static models in, a, in a, a dynamic world. And this is where the rub is. And, and we're living this. It's an, I mean, this is our, our lifetime. It's happening right this minute. So this is why I think information like this course is valuable because it, it gives us insights into perspectives that are not common. They're not shared in the mainstream, but they are the perspectives I think that are healthy uh, based on what we know to be true at, at the time the course was made. You know, and, and a year from now, new information comes to light. There are modules that might change because of that. They would have to, to, to be honest. But as of the time that this, this course is put together, this was the, uh, the best information based on peer-reviewed science. Uh, and that's why I covered so much ground. We covered, <laughs> we covered a lot of ground in, uh, in this course on a lot of different topics. There's a couple of companion questions to this. One is, can you say more about what is behind your belief that climate change is not real? We also have a number of questions about how do we adjust climate change? So sure. there's a lot. Oh, I'm, I, yeah, I'm, I'm happy. First of all, I'm a geologist and I, okay, here I am right now, geologist. I, I love yeah. to talk about this and rarely do I have the opportunity. Uh, climate change is totally real. And I wanna be very clear about that. Um, if anybody says I'm denying climate change, they have misunderstood whatever it is that I'm saying. That's the whole point, that the climate is constantly changing. Uh, and as a scientist, you know, I, I was in the industry back in the 70s, and we were talking about this, as well as the magnetic fields of the earth are, are constantly changing. The problem, Adam, is that uh, the, is that we as humans have built our lives based upon a snapshot of climate in a moment in time, expecting that the climate would always be as it was when we built our society, when we built our cities, and when we, we did all the things we did. We did not take into account that, that climate is dynamic because we weren't being told that. We weren't being told that at all. So when you look at what's happening with climate right now, the only thing it threatens is the way that people have chosen to live 
based upon that snapshot in time. People built homes and condos, you know, uh, two feet from, from the ocean, thinking that the ocean is always going to be where the ocean is. You know, as a geologist, uh, you know, when I was working in the industry, it was, it's interesting, wherever you find a river, for example, there is, uh, there are, on either side of the river, historically, geology will show us that the river has left its banks in the past and created what's called a floodplain. And, uh, and there have been the past policies that said you cannot build your home on a floodplain you can build a business because a business can be replaced, but you cannot build your family's home because your family's home and, and your lives can be lost in rare events where that river is gonna, gonna run over its boundaries. <clears throat> that same principle should apply on a larger scale with ocean plains instead of flood plains. Uh, and, and it hasn't. And even now, uh, I live in Northern New Mexico I'm looking at new housing being built on the floodplains of rivers just because they haven't been out of their banks in the last 10 years doesn't mean they're not going to, but somebody has paid off uh, and found a way around those policies and they're now building where it was never, never allowed in the past. Somebody down the road is going to suffer from that. So what climate change is doing, what we call climate change, climate is dynamic. And uh, I mean, I don't know how far back, you know, we even want to go with this. When we look at the geologic records, the ice cores from Greenland and Antarctica are, are some of the primary uh, records. We can see the ebb and the flow of Earth's temperatures over 420,000 years before present. This is interesting because humans only emerged 200,000 years ago. So what it says to us is that Earth was warming and cooling just the way it is now, uh, long before humans ever appeared on Earth. That tells us beyond the shadow of a doubt that humans are not the cause. And I just listened to a, a, broad, a news broadcast in the airports as I was coming back from the Middle East, where they are still saying humans are the cause of climate change. And our young people are believing this. And based upon that lie, they are feeling justified to violate uh, and damage any property that they see that they believe now is contributing to the, 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 what they're being told is, is making earth an unsafe place to live. So it, it is shredding our society and our young people uh, because they're not being, what they're saying is, is not being, uh, it's not honest. So we did not cause it. What we know is that carbon dioxide, this is the other thing, carbon dioxide is being demonized. It's, we're being told it's a poison. We're being, uh, all carbon, <laughs> we're being told is, uh, is, is something that we need to get rid of, which is a death sentence for Earth. And we know this because when carbon dioxide levels have dropped below critical thresholds in the past, Earth dies, forests die, uh, uh, large animals, dinosaurs, large mammals, saber-toothed tigers, things like that have died out when, when the carbon drops. That number, the critical threshold, is right around 184 parts per million. When Earth has been above that, it has been the greenest and the lushest that it's been, which is where we are right now. Earth is greener now than, than it was uh, 100 years ago. So the CO2, the warming, it's a problem because it is, it is a problem for the lifestyles that we have chosen as a civilization on earth. Does that make sense if I say it that way? And rather than compensating and adjusting for the climate change that's cyclic, that history tells us we can expect, rather than, than doing that, the arrogance of, the, of the, the policies that are out there now are telling us that somehow we're going to stop this natural rhythm. Now, do we need to stop burning fossil fuels? Absolutely, and I, I've, I've been very clear on this. We need to stop burning fossil fuels because, because oil is a precious resource that cannot be replaced when it's gone. And without that oil, we can't do what we're doing right now. We can't have this conversation. We can't we wouldn't have the computers we have. We won't have the electronics. We won't have the medical technology. So we need to stop burning it. And this is where 
these issues, they're all connected because this ties into another module. We've had the technology to stop burning oil and to provide clean, sustainable forms of energy for over 70 years. But economically, uh, it hasn't made sense to the powers that be. So, so we're not using the, the forms of energy. And, you know, I talked about the, some of them in, in this course. So when we say that climate change isn't happening, climate is a dynamic system. It will always change. We <clears throat> came out of an ice age uh, right around 12,000 years ago. And we are in a warming period. It's called, it's, it's called the interglacial period. It's between the, the glaciers. Uh, we should be in a warming cycle now, and we are. And if we were not, I would be concerned. If we weren't in the warming cycle, I would look at that, at the rhythm on those charts, and I would say, what's wrong? Why aren't we in the warming cycle? We are not the warmest that Earth has ever been. We're nowhere near the warmest that Earth has ever been. Earth has been warmer in the past, and it's had more CO2 in the past, uh, but we didn't have high-rise condos built on, on the shore in the past. We didn't have entire nations built on land that is below sea level in the past. Uh, and, you know, one of the examples I, I gave, if we were serious, if we were really serious about this stuff, the powers that be, they would adopt the energy sources that stop kicking CO2 into the atmosphere. We are adding to the CO2. There's no doubt. There's no doubt that we are. You have to say that because our industry creates carbon dioxide. The carbon dioxide is, is in the atmosphere. If they were serious about eliminating that, they would have gone with the energy sources that don't produce that CO2 that we've had for 70 years, and they, they haven't done that. So, you know, we have to, we have to look at that. We have to look at that really, really carefully. But the, <clears throat> the demonization of the carbon uh, is concerning because we are carbon as well. We are carbon-based life. And the transhuman movement that is trying to replace our carbon-based life with synthetic polymers and with, with synthetic materials that take away the DNA, that take away. If, if you've got synthetic skin based on a polymer, there's no DNA in that any longer. Uh, and the same with you know, the synthetic organs or you know, the chemicals they're putting into the blood. Uh, all this ties together. We're demonizing carbon. We're demonizing ourselves. We are carbon-based beings. So I, I think you have to have common sense in, in all of the things that we're talking about here. And what happens is our, we tend to live in a world where things are pushed to extremes. And I think we're seeing those extremes uh, play out right now. Uh, there's a whole conversation about why. You know, what are, what are the agendas underlying this and, and the competing agendas? different ideas, different visions of what the world should look like. It's probably beyond the scope of what we can do in a, uh, you know, uh, this mentoring session, but I think it's a conversation worth having. Uh, but the, so the bottom line is, is climate is changing and that's the whole point. We knew it was coming. And what we could have done, Adam, for example, you look at what's happening in the Northeast right now, the United States, big storm, people without power, people died. Uh, still probably finding people that, that have died. Climate change brings, uh, you know, the kinds of storms that we're seeing, but they're not new in the New England states. We see these big ice storms come in that weigh on the power lines to the point where they snap and they break and the, and the, the power poles collapse and people go for days or weeks sometimes without power, no heat, no way to fix food, no way to care for themselves. A conscious society who is honest and truthful and factual about where we are in climate would compensate for that. For example, just one example, by burying the power grid. So putting all of those vital power lines under the ground so that the ice storms aren't going to break them, uh, and I mean, you think about all the jobs that would be created from doing that. It'd be a massive, uh, a massive undertaking. Jobs that are needed right now, 
Think about the trees that we would save because every year they're cutting down trees to rebuild those power lines or the, the telephone poles, the power poles that get snapped off. Uh, people would have heat that they would still have the tough weather, but the, the people would, would have heat in their homes and they'd be able to weather it out uh, in a way that, that's not possible right now. And that, that's just one example of, of, it's called adaptive resilience. Adaptive resilience is where you look at the reality of the world you live in and you act accordingly in a way that reflects that reality. That's different than traditional resilience. Traditional resilience is where you live the life you've always lived and you say, I'm just gonna live this way. Something comes along and a black swan event and that knocks you, uh, you know, off balance and the resilience is how quickly can you get back to where you were. Adaptive resilience is always taking into consideration, honestly, truthfully, and factually, the realities of life so that you can build and think and live uh, accordingly. Uh, we've got a whole course based on this. It's called uh, uh, Radical Resilience that I offer through, uh, through my website. So, uh, so. There's a lot that we can say about this, but I want to be clear, I've never denied the climate change. The, the fact that it's happening is the whole point. And, um, and this is one of those places where science and politics have compromised our ability to respond in a healthy way to a natural change. And now there are scientists who are, are thinking they can stop the, the natural rhythms. And that is an arrogant perspective because when you stop the natural rhythms, the, <laughs> the ripple effect of, of that is just unimaginable. So it's one of those places where you, you've heard the term, uh, uh, a little knowledge is dangerous. And, and I think that's exactly you know, what, what we're seeing with some of the, the climate scientists. By the way, there was a document that was just signed by bona fide climate scientists in the United States. There aren't that many. Uh, who are pushing back on the political narrative saying enough is enough. We've got to stop the false narrative because we're causing human suffering uh, and we are not on board with, and these are, these are bona fide climatologists. When you hear the, the statistics, something like 97% of scientists agree, blah, 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 uh, you know, with, with climate narrative, you look at who those scientists are and the vast majority of them are beholden to financial interests that compromise, mm -hmm. uh, and there's a conflict of interest in, in what they're saying, including the, science, the climate scientists at the UN, which is, is very, uh, very unfortunate. So I just, uh, we could go on and on about this. And I'm, you know, we spent so much time on this and Bitcoin, I'm happy to go over. Uh, I know scheduled for an hour. I'll, I'll go to the bottom of the hour and take as many questions as we can. But I just want to say these are important topics. And what it tells me, Adam, is that people are taking what they see in the course and they're saying, well, if this is true, then what does this mean? And that means that this course has awakened uh, a discourse uh, with individuals and uh, among individuals in terms of how we apply this information in our lives. And I think that's a, a healthy thing for us to do right now. So it's worth the time to have these conversations and I appreciate you uh, moderating and, and taking those questions. So I'm, before we go on, I'm just gonna ask, does what I just said, does it make sense? Do you think, do we, do we need to clarify anything, uh, any rough edges before we move on to the next question? Looking through to see if there are companion questions about it, it made perfect sense to me and I love that you know, the sense that, you know, don't, let's not, let's not carve anything that's scientific in, in rock because it is about adapting and it's about learning more. And if you start saying, well, we figured it out, this yep. is the answer, you close your mind and then you don't get some aha moment to come up. So I think that's a beautiful um, segue. I don't see other questions coming in there. Um, on climate, there's, there definitely were some questions uh, earlier, Greg, on the thorium reactor, uh, sure. someone was mentioning a Lawrence Livermore discovery from two weeks ago that seemed to parallel the thorium reactor. And just questions about 
how do how do we learn more about it and why doesn't it why isn't it getting any uh juice why aren't people yeah yeah you know? well those are good questions so i i can't comment on anything i've been out of the loop for three weeks in a holy land tour bubble <laughs> with <laughs> with 150 beautiful souls from 27 nations were represented on this tour and uh so i i'm i'm not current on those those discoveries thorium is has always been really interesting all the way back to the manhattan project uh, you know, I, I think that scientists would have gone with thorium as an energy source uh, in the world if we had not been in wartime. So un unfortunately, a war uh, drives technology because the funding is almost unlimited. When a government wants something, the funding is unlimited. The equipment is the most uh, advanced that's available. Uh, the best minds are called from universities and from uh, from corporations, and they're brought together to solve problems. And the uh, the Manhattan Project is a perfect example of that. So thorium is not a secret. They've known about this. They again, they went with uranium because of the plutonium byproduct. Now that the Ukraine war is happening for all the reasons that it is and the energy implications uh, of, of what is happening are, are making the ripples that they're making, thorium is, is back in the news. It, it props up every once in a while. Uh, there are lobbyists that are lobbying against thorium in favor of fossil, fossil fuels. The fossil fuel industry has very powerful lobby. <clears throat> and, um, uh, again, if you Google or, you know, Wikipedia, uh, thorium, they'll say it's an unproven technology, which is absolutely not true at, at all. So there's a concerted effort to put thorium on, on the back burner. One of the exciting things that I'm seeing, I'm just going to talk to our community here. Uh, uh, we have the, the segment with uh, Nassim. I brought Nassim Harman in. Uh, to, to talk about the, the vacuum flux energy, the Planck energy. If we delay thorium long enough, I mean, we, we could have had thorium over the last 30 years, 40 years, if we were really concerned about CO2. If, if that was an honest concern, we have alternatives. Uh, so I, I think it's been a political concern that has been voiced, but then you look at the actions behind the scenes and, you know, all the, <laughs> the politicians flying around in private jets, you know, and supporting and owning stock in industries that are actually fueling the very CO2 that they say is so dangerous in, in our lives. So there's obviously a conflict of, of interest that's happening there. So, but we haven't gone with thorium yet. And it may be Adam, in all honesty, if this has been delayed so long, we may skip the thorium step. And we may be coming very, very close to the era where we introduce the Planck energy, uh, vacuum energy, essentially what people call zero point or, or free energy. Because as you heard Nassim say, the technology is already there. It's not that there's some mystery to figure out. Uh, politically, there is, there's not a lot of will to bring this to the forefront right now. And there's actually a lot of energy to prevent it from coming to the forefront. And a lot of that is based in fear. <clears throat> and the fear, it's this zero sum thinking. It's, it's the same with Bitcoin. The fear of Bitcoin is if Bitcoin catches on in a big way, that traditional banking is gone. And that's not true. I think there's a place for both. Uh, if zero point energy, if, if Planck energy is implemented, there's a thinking that everything else goes away. I don't think that's true. I think there is, a, there's a, an equation. There's a formula for, uh, where all of the forms of energy are, are available to us where they make sense. There are some places, you know, that solar doesn't make sense. Some place that wind doesn't make sense. Some places... We're going to run out of rare earth minerals, so we can't rely on a 500-year future of, uh, you know, of solar panels and, and windmills and electric cars. It's it's just not feasible because we don't have the materials, and they're toxic to begin with. 
so I, I think we may skip the thorium step. Uh, if it's not embraced in the next couple of years, and we may just jump right over that, and, and we may begin seeing uh, plonk, plonk vacuum generators, or if, if you want to call them that, uh, introduced on a small scale to begin with, but I, I think it will catch on pretty quickly. Uh, but again, this is all, uh, a lot of it is being driven politically. And I used, when I was a kid, I used to think politics and science were completely separate. And uh, I would always hoped that they would be. But now the political environment is what makes possible the development, the funding, the development, the implementation, the acceptance uh, of these new technologies. So um, this is why I think people are becoming more interested, they're becoming more involved, young people are becoming more involved in in the political narrative because it literally shapes the, uh, the world that we are, are living in now and that we're going to find ourselves and our children will find ourselves living in because it is dictating what technologies are being allowed to come forward. So the tech is there. It's just the political will to bring these things forward. Uh, and the, unfortunately, living in a world where we've been conditioned to think of everyone as winners and losers. The thinking is, if we bring these forward, that everybody else is going to lose. And I, I don't think that's true at all. I don't think it, it has to be true. Uh, and I think the next generation will embrace what I'm saying. The generation, our generation right now, uh, is, uh, is where that reluctance really is, is coming from. So... Thank you hope, that. hope that helps. But you know, I, I keep seeing thorium show up. I mean, it's it's showing up everywhere. I, there, it was in some. Uh, I think it was the Atlantic. There was an article on thorium, and it shows up on um, you know YouTube feeds every once in a while, and people are talking about it. it's TED talks done on on thorium based energy. It's one of those things. If you haven't heard of it, and then you become aware of it through this course, all of a sudden, you'll see it out there because now it's it's part of your awareness when in truth it's always been out there you, you just weren't tuned into it so uh so i think people are going to find a, a lot there's a big conversation on thorium right now thank you for that there were a couple of questions about radical resilience can you give an outline of it another question about is there a nutritional aspect to adaptive resilience sure so uh, this has nothing to do with the course that we're doing right now just full transparency, um, because I'm working with humanities team, this is all done through humanities team. My website, gregbraden.com, we have a, a course I developed during COVID. Uh, that is, I believe it's a six module course. So it's not like this one, it's, it's six modules on adaptive, it's called radical resilience, adaptive resilience. It's based on a model that was developed uh, through the Stockholm Resilience Institute of adaptive resilience, where it is just what we said, rather than chugging along business as usual, and then something unexpected happens and you get knocked off balance and, and you try to regain your balance. That's the old idea of resilience. <clears throat> this is adaptive resilience says, hey, the world is changing uh, and my thinking and the way I live uh, can reflect those changes so that I am more suited to embrace the changes in a healthy way, uh, rather than you know have a, a catastrophic breakdown somewhere and try to claw my way back to some kind of a balance. So the course is based on resilience happens on a lot of levels. It it is based uh, on physiological resilience. So our bodies need to to have uh, uh, um, our bodies can be tuned to create resilience. I'm, I'm hesitating because I don't want to, I don't know how deep we want to get into this, but there is a module on, on physiological resilience and, uh, and nutrients can be a part of that and supplements can be a part of that. And emotion, emotional resilience can be a part of that, which leads into the rest of the course. There, is, uh, there are different domains of resilience. There is emotional resilience, there's mental resilience, there's psychological resilience, there is spiritual resilience, and there's physiological resilience. One module covers each of those in the radical resilience course. 
So I hope that helps a bit. Greg, www.gregbraden.com. Um, and um, yeah, and it's, it's available. Uh, you can, it's on demand. It's a, an evergreen course. So you can just, you know, you can check it out whenever you'd like to. It's not uh, a whole cohort of people that are going through at a specific time. It doesn't start and end at a specific time. Thank, thank you, Adam, for the opportunity just to, to mention that a little bit. You know, a lot of people have expressed interest in that. And, uh, you know, many of the folks that are on the, in the course have been following you in, in all of your venues. Wow, it's a beautiful thing. Um, there's a, a few questions about what, you know, what can we do our, how, how can we do our part to contribute to the greater good, contact representatives to try to craft a more powerful, resilient message for the future of what kind of industries should one support that are sustainable? Yeah, you know, it's, it's a good question. And I don't think there is uh, a single solution. I think there are many answers and it's not like one size fits all because all of our lives are differently. Some of us uh, are more active in, you know, in the political realm or in the technological realm or, or wherever it is. So I think, first of all, and we've all heard this, my, my dear brother, Bruce Lipton says this every every event that I go to, knowledge is power. And lack of knowledge is lack of power. So it's obvious that there's a movement to remake society. We've never seen social engineering attempted on the scale that you and I are, I'm just gonna look, look at my community right now. I'm gonna look you right in the eye, talking to you. You and I have never seen happen in the world that we're seeing happen in the world right now. An unprecedented attempt uh, at social engineering uh, on levels as high and reaching so deeply into our, our personal lives. We've never seen that happen. Social engineering is our, uh, it's all about our lives and we don't live our lives in a vacuum. Everything is connected to everything else. That's why I put together the modules in this course as I did so that you can pick and choose and draw upon uh, alternative solutions when you experience uh, the social engineering pushing back on the way of life that you've known in the past. Um, 2023, I think, is really going to test our resolve when it comes to, to social engineering. Uh, once again, the, you know, 2030 is the stated goal of organizations like the United Nations for, uh, to accomplish a very high level of social engineering through what are called the sustainable development goals. Play on words, you know, who, who wouldn't want sustainable development goals, beautiful goals when you read them on the surface. And then you look at the fine print of how those goals are accomplished. And from, from my perspective, it's, it's frightening. It's very frightening. So 2030 is the year when they hope to have the goals accomplished, not when they want to start. So to do that, it means they've got to be making those changes in the years leading up to 2030. They're not going to wait until, you know, November of 2029 to, <laughs> to try to implement these goals. So 2023 is going to be a big year. And I think where we will see the biggest change in 23 is in the financial system. This is once, once the financial system uh, has been, the thinking is, once the financial system has been shifted, that other pieces are going to fall into place. So this is the, the introduction of the uh, digital currencies and the, all the things that go along with the digital currencies, including privacy of our personal information, including um, our health status and the various things that make up our health status, our immunizations, our, um, you know, our, what kind of medications we're using and, and all these kinds of things. So I think this is, you're gonna see a lot of this in, in 23. Uh, as we go into 24 and 25, the models are showing uh, another pandemic. And uh, I mean, just the, the, the vi vi virological models uh, predict pandemics based upon mutations of 
you know, existing pathogens. Um, so that's how they know, you know, when a flu season is going to be what a flu season is or, you know, whatever. So I, I don't know for sure when the next pandemic will be. Um, I think we'll have one. And I think it's during that pandemic that the social engineering principles will be tested that are being put into place now in, in 23. So the reason I'm saying that is as those changes are coming down, I want you to know that, uh, that we, have, uh, we have choices in the kinds of, uh, of, of changes that are available to us. And, and I think it's healthy for us to know that. I think it's healthy because if we don't know we have changes, then someone else's vision uh, based upon their agenda is what becomes the reality of our lives. And there are multiple visions and multiple agendas from unelected officials. These aren't people that, you know, that have been elected. So uh, what this all comes down to for me, Adam, and I, I've said this again and again, we've got to identify the values that we cherish as individuals, as families, as communities, as societies, as nations. What's important to us? What are the values that we cherish? And those values then have to become the foundation of the choices that we make. And, and for me, it makes it real easy. Uh, because once you establish those values, you know, you know what you can go with and what you can't. And if, if a policy is going to cross those values, you say, you know, I'm, I'm not willing to compromise that part of my life. And we have the ability to do that. We, as, as, as God eternal within the body, we have the ability, and I think we have the right to do that. But if you don't know that, then we're kind of like a, a, a leaf in the wind. We're blowing to and fro as these policies are debated by politicians that don't even have an inkling into the things that you and I are talking about. And I know because I've talked to some of those politicians, it's not their focus. They don't know we have alternative forms of energy. They don't know that the human body uh, is, is, has the potential that the human body has because they have never been taught these things. It's not something that's come up for them in, in, their, in their educational environment. So I, I think it's important to know that we have that we have choices, but it's also important uh, to share these choices and, and this information in a kind way. We don't have to make somebody else wrong all the time to share a vital piece of information. And we don't have to go to extremes and chastise people that don't believe the way that we believe. Because you have to remember, we are part of, of a decades long experiment in social engineering where our young people, us included, have been indoctrinated into ways of thinking that disempower us. And, and sometimes that can change overnight and sometimes uh, it takes a while to, to, really, to really help uh, our, our friends, families, and loved ones to come to terms with what they have seen on TV that may not be uh, fully factual. So I think it's really important to, to do this with kindness. Otherwise we fall into the trap and we're part of the problem of the, the division and the hate that is driving our societies and, and our families and our nations apart right now. The way to win this battle, there's a battle for our thoughts, a battle for our beliefs, there's a battle for our humanness. And the way to win that battle is to not engage in the battle, but to become the best version of ourselves, to live the best version of ourselves personally. And what that means when it comes to the choices that we make is, is making the choices uh, that support the values that we cherish. But you have to know what those values are first. You got to know what your own values are. And that's a tough one for some people because they've never asked themselves those questions. I mean, they, they kind of know what they like, but they don't really know what, what their red line value is. What, what is the value that is the line in the sand for you. And everybody's got one. Uh, so as, as we come to terms with those for ourselves, then that's reflected in where we spend our money. What business do we support? Who do we support during elections and election campaigns? And that's a tough one uh, for a lot of reasons because there's a lot of misinformation out there, which means we've got to do some work. We've got to do some due diligence. And, 
and really look into you know what we're being offered. Mm-hmm. So uh, it's it is a uh, an active process, and I, I think Adam, if we're alive, if if someone is alive in the world right now, we're here for this process. I don't think we're we're meant to be observers. I don't think we're we're here just for the ride. Some people believe that, and some people it's certainly easier to be here for the ride. <laughs> But, uh, but I think this is the, the window of time where we claim the deep truth of the values that we cherish in our lives, and we bring those values, we make them manifest in, in society. And uh, I don't think there's a clear formula for that. So you've got to have a strong soul compass, you've got to know who you are, and you've got to know what those values are for you. And, uh, and to be able to do it with kindness, I think, is it's part of the equation. So I, I don't know if that makes sense or not. Uh, talk a little bit longer on that than I wanted to, but um, I, I think that's where we go with, with all of this. But that's a very powerful statement. I think that reflects a number of the things that people have put into the chat. Uh, a friend of humanities team, Connie Baxter Marlowe mentions, she says there are evolutionary leaders working within the UN to shift to a unitive narrative. Greg, you're part of this, correct? There have been some accomplishments in this regard. Yeah. Okay, I'm going to give you straight up honest. I am not part of it. I was. I saw the direction they were going, uh, and I, I backed out okay. uh, for a num- number of reasons. And um, uh, probably beyond the scope of what I can do now, I, I think that the uh, evolutionary leadership organization, I think it's a good organization. I've got a lot of dear friends, brothers and sisters. Uh, I think many of them are, are basing their choices on misinformation, disinformation, uh, and information that is simply is not easy to really embrace because they have been so long, so entrenched in, uh, in a belief system that has now been hijacked, and it's difficult for them to see that. So uh, I, I, thought, I think there is potential there. Um, I shared my concerns, and uh, and I'm I'm no longer part of that, uh, and I'm not going to to chastise anyone that is because I th- it's a big picture, and I think we all have our role to play, and I think the ELs are playing a valuable role, Connie, and I, I appreciate you know what you're saying uh, in in this comment. You asked me, and I'm going to be very honest with you. There was a direction that that turned. Uh, it's a direction I cannot support, and um, and for that reason, I'm no longer part of that. And they know that. I mean, it's no secret. I wrote a letter. I wrote a letter and shared that with everybody in in the EL group. So what I'm saying is is not a secret to to anyone. I was very transparent about uh, why I couldn't couldn't support the direction that they chose to go in. This is specific to the Sustainable Development Goals, UN SDG 2030. Yeah. Thanks for sharing that. Well, we're kind of rounding down to the end, into the middle of the hour. And um, are there, is there anything coming up for you, Greg, that you'd like to express based on, on the questions and the topics you've covered now? Do you to close it up? No, yeah, you know, I just first, I, uh, for everyone who's, who's enrolled in this course, obviously this is more than a course. This is more than just a, um, I mean, this is our lives. And it was, it was very healing for me to bring together so many disparate topics uh, and put them into a, a single bundle that reflects our lives. Because, you know, I could talk just about climate, or I could talk just about, you know, alternative financial systems or alternative agricultural systems, we didn't even get to that yet. Or, or the population, the, the, the misconceptions of, of human population, I just had a very well known biologist write to me and ask me why I have not addressed the population bomb. Uh, which is an old term from back in the 1970s when the data doesn't support that that's happening. It's just the opposite. And I I shared that with you in the module. So I I really appreciate your willingness to embrace you as uh, as someone who's taking this course. So many different and seemingly disparate facets of our lives, uh, but the reality is they're all part of of our everyday life and we're being faced with challenges and choices and 
and people who are trying to change the way we're living. And if we don't know that we have a choice, uh, then we become vulnerable to someone else's idea of what the world and, and our lives should look like. And, uh, and all that I want to do is just empower you with the, the deep truth of, of what we now know from a scientific perspective as, as well as a social perspective so that you can make informed choices for yourself. Uh, I would never tell you what to do or what not to. I'm not trying to convince or persuade you of anything, but I want you to know that there's another story that's not the mainstream narrative. And I think it's an empowering story of hope and possibility. Uh, it's a story that gets me up every morning um, because I'm, I'm very passionate about sharing what's possible in our world. And I think it's through the choices we make based on this kind of information that we can create in the world around us, the world that we know is possible in our hearts. And uh, that's really the bottom line for everything we're doing here. So, so with that, um, I think that's the way I would close and, and that part of, uh, of the question. And I'm gonna turn it over to you, Adam, wherever you would like to go with humanity's team from here. Well, I just want to thank you for your generosity, spending this time with us, uh, with the people. There's been well over 250 people different times on the call. Um, so there's a lot of interest. I want to remind everyone that next week, I believe it's Wednesday next week, there's another mentoring session similar to this. And so if your questions didn't get answered, and as you said, Greg, there's some great themes that weren't touched, feel free to bring that up next week. And, um, uh, you know, Bottom of my heart, thank you for doing what you do. It's provocative and thought-provoking and inspiring. Uh, we appreciate you very much, Greg. And oh, thank, thank, thank you so much, Adam. And that, what I'll say to uh, you and, uh, and all the folks behind the scenes, I want to just thank everyone behind the scenes at Humanities Team that, that's helping us out today. I know we spent more time on some topics. We didn't get to some of the others. If you guys, if you will send to me those questions, then I can take those into consideration and answer those on our YouTube channel. We do a, Q, a weekly Q&A on the YouTube channel and then we can make those available as well. I'm happy to do that. That's a great point. Um, Jim or Garth, is there an email address or something that would be the right place to direct any of these so that we can gather them? Uh, we, we will gather the, the questions together and, and send them off to Greg. We'll take okay. care of that. Yep. Thank you. Thanks, Adam. All right. Well, I want to say happy, happy holiday season, post Christmas, pre New Year. I look forward to our next, um, our next conversation. Adam, if you're moderating next week, I won't say goodbye. I'll say, uh, see you then. I want to thank. It's our first time working together. Thank you, brother, for doing a beautiful job. And my love to everyone out there. Have a beautiful, beautiful holiday. And um, I look forward to our next. Great. Back at you, Greg. Everybody, have a great day.